Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through the complete Questing Beast Kickstarter package, essentially. When you backed the Knave 2nd Edition rule set on Kickstarter at the highest level, you got a bunch of extra stuff. So you got just you got this book, but you also got a book of adventures, you got uh, a, a revised version of uh, Questing Beast's old uh, rule set, Maze Rats, and you got a revised, slightly revised, maybe it might just be exactly the same version of The Waking of Willoughby Hall. Now, Maze Rats and The Waking of Willoughby Hall I've gone through before, so I'm just going to quickly tap through them. But the two that I wanted to cover in this video are Knave 2nd Edition, which is the primary book here, and Summer's End and Other One-Page Adventures by Ben Melton. Uh, ben Melton is the, uh, is the uh, person behind Questing Beast, the channel. Now, these two books, uh, and, and of course, I'm going to quickly go through Maze Rats and uh, The Waking of Willoughby Hall as well, but I'll spend most of my time in this video on Knave and Summer's End. So, uh, if you guys know Questing Beast, obviously, really, really influential in the community right now, uh, a really, really positive force in the community in terms of you know, getting ideas out there and helping people to connect with, with other good uh, systems and adventures and things like that. So I, I really appreciate all that he's done. And Knave, well, Maze Rats, first of all, was an excellent contribution I'm, I'm, in my review of that. I, it's just one of the best resources for, for GMs out there. Well, Knave follows right in that tradition. Um, the first edition of Knave, I liked the book, was pretty cool. It had a lot of good tables. But the second edition is a great system and full of those amazing random tables that Maze Rats was full of and just a whole bunch more. It's a really, really fantastic system to check out. Um, it's not out yet, or at least it's not out in physical copy yet. I'm sure that there are you know, PDFs of it uh, going around, but but uh, the physical copy will be released at some point, and I highly recommend you getting that. I, I'm going to be getting it when it comes, but it's not yet produced. So Knave, second edition. First of all, uh, as you guys can see, the cover art and the art throughout is awesome. I'm a sucker for good art, and this is all classic, you know, old school style art. It fits the tone of the game very well. So Knave is essentially a rules light, uh, classless system, OSR system, that's designed to be used it's designed to be easy for new players to use. It's designed to be intuitive for new players in a, in a few particular ways. And it's also just designed to be like, you know, uh, comparable or, or uh, applicable to a lot of other OSR adventures out there. So there's not going to be a whole lot of changes you'll have to do in terms of balancing or rebalancing uh, adventures to use them for Knave. Knave is a, a very interesting game. As I said, it's classless. So what that means is your, your, your character is determined by your ability scores and your equipment rather than by special abilities you get or by picking a class that you then stick to. You're going to have a career, which is kind of like a background from other D&D games, and that will give you some bonuses at some times, but for the most part, you're determining what you're going to be by your ability score combinations, by your equipment, and what you're going to try to do, how you're going to play your character. And that's really cool. There's not a lot of that out there, and I think it's cool to see a, a game like that. Very often the classes, um, you know, to try to keep those archetypes, which we all enjoy, you know, very firmly in the game, people really lean into them, and this is a game that leans away from them. Now, not entirely. There are still uh, there are still you know terms that are used, like for example, strength is called the fighter ability, dexterity is called the thief ability. So if you really really go towards those, you're going to be more like those archetypes. But it's not a class system. So you get uh, it's a d20 system. You're going to roll a d20, add your ability score and any modifiers, which would come from any advantages, disadvantages, and your career, for example. And you're trying to hit a DC 11 plus the task's difficulty, which is usually 5. And if you equal or exceed that, then you succeed. And if you don't equal or succeed that, then you fail. And that's as simple as it is. The whole system is built on that. Um, combat is pretty straightforward, and I like a few of the things that he does in here. For example, maneuvers. Well, I'll go into that a bit more, but maneuvers are a type of action you can do in combat, and it's just simply... A kind of thing. It's just straight up, you can try to do things like disarm or push or stun or blind, etc. You don't have to have an ability to try to do that. The same with sneak attack. Anybody can sneak attack as long as you, um, you know, haven't been seen. <laughs> as long as you're, uh, as long as the person isn't aware of you. And it has a special effect. It always hits and it deals direct damage, which is a particular kind of damage at this point in the game. So the, the, on the front page and on the back page, there's sort of a brief overview of the system. I always like that. And the, the kind of like the main things that the game is about. So how to, how abilities work, how checks work, how combat works, item slots, which is a, how equipment is dealt with in this game, and damage. And damage ties directly into item slots. So essentially you have hit points, 
like any game. But when you go to zero hit points, you start to take wounds, and wounds are essentially crossed off item slots. You have a certain number of item slots, equal to 10 plus your constitution modifier. And when that goes to zero, then you're dead. When you fill it up with wounds, then you're dead. Monsters and NPCs just die at zero hit points. So uh, hit points um, are sort of more like, you know, it's something like Into the Odd or something like that, where hit points are sort of your hell, uh, you know, your 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 uh, hero points or your sort of, you know, plot points or whatever it is. They're not your flesh. They're not actually, you're not taking damage. Hit points come back fully every rest, every long rest. But a, but a wound, you only heal one per day, basically one per long rest in a safe haven. So you really have to be careful when you start taking direct damage or damage to your, your health, your item slots. And that's cool because that means as you get wounded, you're carrying less and less, and your character's abilities are going to be defined by your equipment. So as your equipment goes down to zero, you're going to get fewer and fewer abilities. If you're a spellcaster with like, you know, six spellbooks... And you start to lose spell books because you start taking damage, you're going to have to drop spells, essentially. Or have somebody else carry them for you until you can uh, recover them. So that's interesting. Spell, spell casting is done through spell books. You, can, you, can, you have to have the book on you in order to cast the spell, and you can, each spell book has one spell in it. So essentially, the number of spell slots, the number of item slots you take up with your spells and your spell books, that's, that makes you more of a wizard. Right? If you fill up your item slots with armor, then you're going to be more of a you know, tanky character, etc. So really, really cool stuff there. Um, again, that's just the front page. You get an overview of the whole game on the front page. Great art. Great art throughout. A table of contents now. Um, again, not not uh, the, the this isn't hyperlinked, but this is hyperlinked, which I, I like. I'm always a fan of hyperlinked tables of contents. You get an introduction and tables. And like, this is, you know, <laughs> this is what this book is is primarily for. Prominent, at least a prominent feature of this book is the, uh, are the tables in it. First page of the actual book, once you get past the introduction and table of contents, is the game master duties and the player duties. I like that. Straightforward. This is what you're going to be doing if you're a game master. This is what you're going to be doing if you're a player. How ability scores work and how creation works. And the different careers that you get. Uh, when you when you pick a career, um, you get, or you pick two careers. I said, yeah, you pick two careers. And so when you have, uh, when you're doing something that relates to those careers, you can get a bonus. And you also get some equipment that comes from those careers as well. Very much inspiration from Into the Odd and things like that. Item slots and wounds, how that works. I've already kind of gone into that, but uh, really cool system there. And it really, it all fits together. You know, they're, they're, these aren't, uh, very often people will try these new RPGs and they'll kind of like hack a lot of different inspirations together. And the result is kind of a haphazard thing, right? It's like, well, there's this system that's kind of attached to that system. It's sort of Frankenstein's monster sort of thing. This is not the case for, for Nave. Nave really seems to blend the different inspirations that it draws from really seamlessly. So this idea of a classless system building into the way that wounds work, that's a really cool idea. Because equipment solves both the wounds problem, or it helps to contribute to the wounds equation, and it also contributes to the class equation. And so blending that all together makes, it really, makes a lot of sense. So going through... We have how to level up and what that does to your character. You get certain ability points, and you're, you're going to be basically just increasing your ability points as you as you level up. That's that's basically it. Uh, and then you get uh, you get you get to re-roll your hit points using an additional d6. Um, and if you don't get a total greater than your last maximum, you add one to the maximum. That's what I've actually been using in my own Shadow Dark games, using this exact system. Now, not with the yeah yeah with the, with the class hit die instead of just a straight, straight d6, but. Um, what I like about that, is when, where as you level up, you, you just re-roll your hit point maximum using an additional d6. You keep adding one extra each time. And then if it's greater than it, you set it to it. And if it's not greater than it, you just add one. What I like about that is that if you roll badly for hit points, you're very likely to get a big boost to them at the next level. But if you roll really well for your hit points, you're very only likely to get one. And so it really does, over time, balance out characters in terms of hit points. You're not going to have some characters that just go way up in terms of their health and characters who just get stuck at the bottom. Theoretically, you could, but it would be very unlikely. And I think that's better. Uh, how checks work and how to set target numbers and all of that. Social checks. Now, one interesting thing uh, is that, as we're going to see, combat uh, initiative, when we get there, is set with a charisma check, which I think is really interesting. It's, I haven't really seen that before. Uh, and I, I'm not quite sure why that makes sense. I guess it's like, you know, you're intimidating the other side into like, you know, reading their character, reading the moves and seeing who's going to go first. So I guess that might be 
one thing. But uh, it's a charisma check side-based initiative, which I think is, is cool. Rules for traveling and fatigue, rules for weather, and here's where we start a lot of these random tables. We get the different signs as you're traveling, uh, locations to travel to, structures that you might find there, place traits as you run into D100 tables for each of them. Delving rules when you're in the dungeon. There's the dungeon hazard die and how that works. And I really like the dungeon hazard die. At the end of each turn, you roll the die. Right on a D6, you have an encounter. Or on a, on a, on a one, you have an encounter. On a two, you just take fatigue. On a three, burn, which is lit torches burn out. New torches can be lit from the embers of the previous one. You have to use torches. The delve shift, something weird happens. There's a list of shifts in the on page 14, the next page, that uh, you can use as inspiration, but something happens in the dungeon. So it's an environmental change. And then a fifth is a sign of the next random encounter, and then uh, you just pick this, the thing that you rolled the sign for. And then six is a free, no effect. So you have a one in six chance of having no, no nothing happen. But you only have a one in six chance of actually having an encounter. Everything else is just something interesting happening in the dungeon. That's awesome. I think the you know the alternative very often, and if you take like an OSE game, um, very often uh, in those dungeons, what you have is a random encounter table where like ten of the encounters, you know, say there's like say there's like twelve encounters on the table. Maybe eight of them will be non non combat encounters, and then four of them will be combat encounters. But that's it, right? Either you have one of those things, or you don't have anything. This has a lot of stuff built in, right? You might you might have had a really rough, harsh condition that uh, you have to role play and you have to narrate if, if you roll a two with a fatigue. Why do you take fatigue? Why do you take damage unless you spend the next turn resting? Well, you have to narrate that, but it's something interesting, and it will, it will make your players choose new things. Okay, do we want to rest or do we all want to take some damage and push through? It's kind of cool. Uh, and then a bunch of random tables for dungeons. Delve shifts, rooms, room details, and room themes. Really, really awesome if you were you know, just creating a random dungeon or, or filling in a dungeon that doesn't have very much in it, which, you know, you can go online and find a lot of dungeons that are pretty bare bones. So this would be a great way to fill in other dungeons. And then more tables for these dungeons. Trap effects, hazards, and mechanisms. You have encounters and the NPC reaction tables and what they want. It's much more than just sort of hostile or whatever it is. Like these, these are 2d6 and each one is different. Two is kill the NPC, so it's what they want. But 12 is to ask, the, to ask to join the PC's party. Most likely, it's going to be six, seven, or eight. They're going to avoid the PCs, ignore the PCs, or follow or observe the PCs. That's most likely if you just have an NPC reaction. Really cool. And how reactions work, right? So you're like a wisdom check. Uh, to, be, to see if you're surprised or not. And then if you don't have an obvious reaction, you roll on this table. And the activities that a monster might be doing. You know, you could combine this with a random encounter table. Really great. Or you could do something like what Baron Durop does in his creating random encounter tables, where he has the monster, he has their general activity, and then he has a complication. And I think you could put those three together and use this table to really help. Combat and how combat works. As I said, initiative is a charisma check. Attacks are strength for melee, wisdom for ranged, because you're trying to spot weaknesses, you're trying to see it's not dex, which really helps, I think, to keep dex within bounds. It's funny, because in 5th edition, my 5th edition games, the two most important ability scores by far are wisdom and dex. Uh, wisdom because most of the spells are wisdom saves, and because perception is so important. But uh, but but really, yeah, attacks, uh, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense that you're, you're trying to use wisdom there. You have these rules for maneuvers, you have rules for sneak attacks and for power attacks. Really cool stuff. You can choose to break your sword or break your weapon after you've hit before you've rolled damage to make it a crit, basically. But then you've broken your weapon. And then different hazards you can run into in the dungeon, how spell casting works. And then uh, 100 spells that are pre-generated. Uh, um, really interesting there. <laughs> There's a spell called Catherine. A woman wearing a blue dress appears for intelligence hours. She will obey polite, safe requests. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. But then there's stuff like haste, obviously. Leap, uh, duplicate, befuddle, pacify. Uh, yeah, a great, great list of pre-made spells. But then, in the vein of maze rats, there is a, an ability to generate new spells. The d12 for the spell formulae. Of course, there's a D100 table for wizard names, which would be great. And then there are the different tables you would roll after you've done the formulae. Qualities of the spell, effects of the spell, elements of the spell, and forms of the spell. So it might be an, uh, an abominable, crushing spell that is, it uses the element of butter, and its form is a spray. That'd be very strange, but you could do that. Then it's up to you, the player and the GM, together, to come up with what that spell does. 
Now, if, it, if the GM is making a spell for the player to find, then of course that's probably all pre-made. But if the player is like, I want to create a spell, they might roll on these tables to see what they can find or invent. And there's some really funny ones too. And of course you could use these tables not just for spell effects, you can use them for anything. You need a random element like soot or taffy or ivory or dust. You could use this uh, table uh, if you want a random effect or quality. Great. Really, really great tables for, for more than just spells. And then, of course, you get more magic tables as well. Mutations that go along with spell effects, delusions that might, of course, result from bad spells or curses or something like that. Disasters that can occur, not just, of course, magical disasters, but primarily magical disasters, and then different magic schools. And that's really interesting because, you know, you think of magic schools as like maybe eight magic schools you know, or, or five magic schools or whatever it is with the different games you, you play. Here's a hundred of them. A hundred different magic schools. Really interesting. To devote, a, you know, a, to, to take a, like a random selection of these and make a wizard school or a wizard tower, where the wizard is devoting himself to studying these particular elements of magic, like for example, chromatic. Uh, you might have him pick three. He's a chromatic wizard who also does the spells of finding and time. That'd be kind of cool. Color, finding, and time. Yeah, quite interesting. Relic magic, which is essentially holy magic, uh, but not necessarily holy. It could be, you know, you know, whatever. It might be outsiders or nature spirits or things like that. But it's uh, sort of the thing that druids, warlocks, or or clerics might might fall into. And you have uh, rules for shrines, relics, blessings, favors, and disfavor, or advice for those things. And then domain table, d100 domains, uh, d100 symbols for that particular uh, outsider or saint or god or whatever it might be. Then you have alchemy rules, so potion effects, brewing rules, harvesting rules, and again, more like advice, but there is some, there are some technical rules here. And then D100 potions with D100 textures, tastes, colors, and ingredients. Equipment, random equipment, uh, not random equipment, but equipment costs and things like that, costs of living and how you can live that way. And then tools and miscellaneous items. Books, clothing, fabrics, decorations, treasures, materials, weapons, item traits. Uh, buildings and how buildings, uh, how much they cost to build, how the you know construction of them and, and what it might look like. Warfare rules, very simple warfare rules, which is cool if you want to do mass combat. City themes, city events, street details, buildings, inn names, uh, food traits, food, factions, faction traits, missions, rewards, lots and lots of great tables, downtime rules, recruiting rules, NPC tables for names, personalities, details, professions, and goals, assets, liabilities, relationships, and mannerisms. If you take this and combine it with the Maze Rats tables, you will have an infinite variety, basically infinite variety of NPCs, almost an infinite variety of NPCs to use. So fantastic tables here. Monsters uh, and a D100 table for monsters. Now there's a bestiary, but it's a very small one. This is it. This is the whole extent of the bestiary, but the monsters are pretty simple. You can create your own, especially with the tables that they give you. Animal forms, organs, monster traits, powers, scent, sounds, tactics, and weaknesses. Great tables. You have an example of gameplay towards the back, and then you have a designer commentary, and I think this is really interesting. Uh, ben goes through basically all the different things that he did in this game and, and talks about where he got inspiration from and why he did what he did. And I think that's really cool, especially if you're using, if you're a game designer and you want to make your own games, to see the process of a great game designer and the sort of way that he brought in particular elements of this and that and the other thing into his game. Yeah, really cool. I wish we saw more of this too. Uh, really helpful for, for those of us who like designing games, like designing systems. At the very back, you have a character sheet with a, 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 an isometric, maybe you might say sample dungeon, but there's nothing else beyond this one page of it. But it's still really cool to have a little sample dungeon here. You could fill it in pretty easily. And I like the, the art here is great. Uh, and then a sample hex crawl. Again, there's no rules set for it. There are no descriptions of the hexes, but just here's one if you would like to use it. And it's cool. Very, very uh, flavorful. The Fortress Unvanquishable, the Troll Boulders, the Whale Grave, the Lonely Keep, the Borderland Camp, the Primordial Radix, uh, you know, a Headland Fort, Prayerless Monastery, Ooh, that's pretty cool, the Dig Hole. You start in that Borderland Camp, you know, you have a perfectly uh, perfectly good hex crawl to fill in and to uh, to explore. You could use this for West Marches very, very easily. In fact, uh, it makes me want to do that. And then you have the back page, which is a brief rundown of some of these other rules. 
And that's it. As it says on the back, it is a comprehensive guide toolkit for GMs who build wide open fantasy worlds. Flexible classless rule set. Nave second edition is fantastic. I heartily recommend it. If you can get a copy of it in physical when it comes out, you should. I'm certainly going to because the, the physical book looks gorgeous. It hasn't, isn't out yet, so I can't review it in terms of its quality, but just from what we've seen, it looks really, really, really good. Uh, but a PDF is totally serviceable and will, will serve you well. Now, I want to cover really quickly a couple of the other books here. Uh, Maze Rats Re Revised, which is something that we've covered, I've covered on this channel before. Um, it has a cool new cover, but the content of the book seems to be pretty much the same. I mean, there might be some minor adjustments. I haven't gone through very, very carefully to see what, what's changed on each page. But if you've seen Maze Rats, if you've seen that quick review that I did, you'll, you'll pretty much know what this is. But you'll see that it's just, again, full of random tables. That's kind of what this book is, is just random table forms. These are mostly D66 tables, so they're a lot smaller than what you're getting in Nave. Nave is a D100, you know, D100 tables for all this stuff, as opposed to D66, so just way more entries in Nave. But still, you could combine that with this, and I'm sure there would be differences, and you could use, you know, the special... There are some tables in this that are not quite the same as that, and so you could use them together. Uh, but and, and on its own, by the way, Maze Rats is a great little quick system for running games on the fly. Uh, I, I would say Maze Rats is probably the easiest game to pick up and play of any of the OSR games that I've played. So again, very simple, but great art. Uh, great art on the front and back cover. Uh, and I'm glad that Maze Rats is finally getting a print copy or a physical copy that you can actually get with a good cover. Uh, the old ones, you know, just was it was a, mostly a print on demand or, or print as you not print on not print on demand it was just a you know you could print it yourself i suppose so it'll be nice to get this actual uh copy and then the wiki of willoughby hall as well i've already covered this again this is one of my favorite adventures of all time it's so so good uh, I've, I've run it twice and it was just absolutely absurd and delightful each time uh so again you can do check out the video where i cover that um but just the the, the whole thing is great and uh once again if you don't have it um, you should get it. <laughs> Heartily recommend this book as well. Really fantastic, The Waking of Willoughby Hall. The last thing I wanted to cover in more detail is Summer's End, which is, uh, it's, well, Summer's End and other one-page adventures by Ben Milton. This is a 15-page PDF full of one-page dungeons, or one-page adventures, I should say. They're not all just dungeons. Uh, these are all fantastic. I think a lot of these were developed for uh, Ben's Patreon, and so his Patreon... Uh, people who have paid his Patreon have had access to some of these at least. But I think this is the first time they're going to be available to anybody. And some of them are, I mean, I think they're all really good, but some of them are excellent adventures. Um, yeah, that's right. So this is a collection of one-page adventures originally created for his Patreon supporters. Revised and expanded for the print release. So the first one is Summer's End. Uh, this is a really cool mountain. Uh, it's, it's like a six-mile hex right here. You just have one hex and you put this into your world and you have a, a really detailed, really interesting set of factions and a couple dungeons perhaps, and an adventure going on. And it's just really easily laid out on a mountain. And there you go. You just have a, a location to put into your world. Summer's End, the mountain. There's the Tree of Swords, there's St. Festus' tomb, there's a ranger camp, a bandit camp, an alchemist camp, so you have several factions there. The Tower Dolores, uh, you have encounter tables uh, and encounter activities, and then the Grove of the Summer Worm. So, a dragon. It's great. Absolutely great. A golden serpent of giant size is sleeping in a hedge of brambles, guarded by two thorn elementals. There is a waterfall nearby. If woken, the sword will be cowed by St. Festus' sword and will obey the holder. Lacking the sword, the worm will regard intruders as meals. So that's very clearly a, you know, a, a, a quest going on there. And of course, one of the swords in the Tree of Swords is the sword of St. Festus, which is what you need to go um, track down the summer worm. Okay, uh, that's, that's one whole adventure right there. A Gathering of Blades, which is another. You have Fort Peregrine, River's End, which is a little town or village. You have the abandoned Wizard Tower, which is uh, taken over by a Lepidocracy, which is a spider-shaped construct made entirely out of sentient magical swords. <laughs> that's so cool. Uh, you got an encounter table, Crow Lake, Giant Cairns, which is a gelatinous king. Cool little, again, you could put, throw this into your, into your world as a, as a Six Mile Hex. There it is. You have a pre-made hex right there. Uh, very interesting. More interesting than a lot of other uh, hexes you're going to probably make yourself. And it's just pre-made for you. 
the Raiders of Wolfsea. So this is a weird patch of ocean. So this would be harder to fit into just a random uh, hex crawl, but you certainly could if you're doing an island hex crawl or something like that. Three pirate crews, each possessing a scrap of a lost treasure map, vie for dominance of a weird patch of ocean known as Wolf Sea. Every time you sail to a new location, there is a two and six inch chance of having an encounter. If you do have an encounter, roll to see if it occurs as you're leaving, one through two, on the way, three through four, or just as you arrive, five through six. And the islands are really cool that are detailed here. You have the Salt Spire, the Wormstone, Rackham's Rest, uh, and the Harpy's Teeth, with different wool, uh, pirates and, and sailing around, and of course the treasure that you might try to find with their um, with their parts of the treasure map. The Sands of Kaldamar. Have a, uh, the Burning Lands are ruled by the city of Is, which is located on skids and pulled across the plains by a crawling, domesticated giant. That's so cool. Great, great idea. You have the Scar, the Cactus Forest, uh, the Chalk Mesas, and the Crawling Citadel. And then Day Encounters and Night Encounters. So what you get with these hexes is essentially just a play box, or a, I mean a sandbox. In this case, literally, basically. But in most cases, uh, you know, figuratively. And just a place to play. Some cool connections. It's going to do a lot. It's going to be up, a lot up to you uh, to, to fill in the details, obviously. But the ideas here are very evocative and very interesting. And they're better than most ideas that most people have. And I think that's that's the key for, you know, a lot of this sort of like uh, more inspirational adventures, the ones that leave a lot to, to you. You know, there's the lazy ones, which are like, here is a bare room and it has a couple kobolds in it. It's up to you to make it interesting. It's like, that's just lazy, right? But <laughs> that's not this sort of thing. These are interesting ideas that, that set your imagination going and, and kind of set it off. And I like that a lot better. The Witches of Willowmire, six feuding witches, a swamp crawling with aquatic zombies, and a predatory heron the size of a giraffe. That's all you need to know about this one. It sounds awesome. Uh, it would be a lot of fun uh, with the different uh, witches and what they're feuding and what they want. They all want to be the Swamp Witch. Uh, the Wizards of Sparrow Keep, which is another great hex. The Tower of Dr. Mortimo. That sounds like a really uh, classic like pulp adventure. The Tower of Bertram Bartleby. The Tower of Anaximandes. Anax Imenides, the Unquenchable. Sparrow Keep. The Tower of Hermion the Elder. It's a bunch of Wizard's Towers. The House of Agrippina Root. <laughs> so great a uh, bunch of feuding wizards again it's very similar to the witches of Willemire but uh, you got a bunch of uh, wizards who are in this region the alchemist repose this is a more particular dungeon this is a really interesting one so there are these five robots that are walking around and they all have a function and target tag and these are punch cards essentially and you can find different uh, punch cards and use them on the different constructs here so you can, you know, there's destroy, repair, and retrieve. Uh, and then there are alchemist, construct, crack, elf, intruder, and punch card. So you can find the retrieve punch card, punch cards. Then you could slot those into a construct and it will then go off and find another punch card to bring it back to you, right? There's some really cool ideas in that. So it's a dungeon and you can encounter it. And if you just run into these constructs and fight them and destroy them, you can, but you can find ways of making them work for you. That's such a cool idea. And the dungeon itself is great. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in here. Uh, yeah, really, really fun. Drums in the Deep sounds, you know, Lord of the Rings-esque. Uh, you got Bone Boys. You've got huge spiders, uh, sewer channels, gas pockets, driftwood statues. So really interesting there. Uh, probably some sort of sewer that you're dealing with here. Yeah, looks like a, a yeah. For example, it's, this would be like underneath a city or something. Yeah, enter the sewer by rappelling down from a large storm drain above. Your rope will end right in the center of the cistern. So yeah, it's a sewer sewer adventure. Lair of the Keymaster. There's a whole bunch of keys. Silver keys, gold keyholes. It's, it's very much like Resident Evil, where you're trying to find the right key for the right lock. <laughs> Bronze key, silver key, gold key. So you're trying to, there's sort of a puzzle dungeon in that regard. The Hollow Prince. A really interesting idea here. Huge golem made of milky glass lies in several pieces in the northern door while three clerics attempt to repair it. It's a sort of cleric um, scribe dungeon here. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that basically there is no base description of the dungeon. You've kind of got to read through the whole thing. Some of them have like a little, you know, one sentence description. I wish that were the case for all of them, but you can easily find out what's going on here. There is a bound prisoner wearing a grotesque silver mask. And if you release the prisoner, 
Uh, it will reveal a face that always looks like the last person the viewer killed. It will aid any rescuer. That's creepy. What is this thing? Right. Really, really interesting. Uh, the Witch and the Wolf. Gordon, uh, who is a psychopathic child, hides from the monsters roaming the halls. He's escaped the witch's clutches, but has no interest in escaping or rescuing his friends. He wants the witch's power, which he thinks correctly is contained in her lost ring. He will act scared and innocent for as long as it benefits him. So there's a witch, a bunch of kids who've been stolen, uh, cauldrons, and then there's this kid, Gordon, who wants to uh, destroy. And then there's a gingerbread golem, which I think comes from inspiration from uh, Dolmenwood. The King's Thirst. That's a great, great description. It's a vampire king, and there's a trap that, that you know, why do you have a trap, a pit trap in a dungeon? <laughs> like, with spikes, like, what's the point? Well, this one gives you a reason for it. There is a thing living, or rather undying, underneath that trap, and the blood from the trap drains down into it and awakens the vampire king. That's super cool. So, you know, why would you build a death trap? Well, it's sort of like Tomb of Horrors, right? You build a death trap full of tre rumors of treasure to lure adventurers in there. Why? Well, so that the, uh, the, the, the demi-lich can turn back into his lich form. That's sort of the idea here, too. Why would you build a trap, uh, a, a you know, treasure-filled dungeon full of death traps? Well, because you're trying to collect the blood of the adventurers who come. That's great. And then you get the final page there. So, Summer's End is a fantastic collection of adventures. I highly recommend getting it if you can once it comes out. Uh, if you happen to have some of those adventures individually, you know, you should run them if you haven't, because they're all really cool, and I definitely would like running running these for one-shots or dropping them into a campaign or a hex crawl or a West Marches. It'd be really cool to do, and easy, because they're all... The dungeons are self-contained, and the hexes are self-contained. So you could throw them into a hex crawl, and you'd be all set, have a very set, you know, really interesting set of hexes. So I hope you guys uh, get these books. Uh, Questing Beast has done great work, great work here. Nave Second Edition is really fascinating, really interesting, definitely worth getting. If if only for the, the random tables, even if you don't want to play the system, because there's so many, so much good advice there and so many good tables to use. That's a 45-page book full of great stuff. The same thing with Summer's End. Uh, great adventures, you could take what you want from them, even if you didn't run them as is. And then, of course, Maze Rats and Willoughby Hall are awesome. Well, I hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll see you in another video.